thank you and on the phone for um, taking the time out today during your lunch uh, lunch period to, to, to learn a little bit about um, the California Rapid Assessment Method or, or CRAM. As a very brief introduction to myself, in addition to what um, Eric just mentioned, um, for the three years uh, that I've been here at Square, I've been fairly involved in various aspects of CRAM implementation and development. And all the information I'm going to be presenting um, um, will we'll be presenting uh, with you today and discussing. Uh, I have about 45 minutes to an hour today to present a rather large amount of information on CRAM. And I know people on the phone um, have various um, technical backgrounds and familiarity with the, the CRAM method. So my goal is, is essentially to make this presentation be uh, why, the what, and the how of CRAM. And hopefully, by the presentation, you'll leave with a better understanding of really three um, key topic areas. Um, why CRAM was developed, why the state developed a, a rapid um, what CRAM, what, what is this method, and, and just kind of the basics of how it works. But I think most importantly, I want you to take away is, is how CRAM can be useful um, to your agency or organization, and how, how could you use this to answer some, some um, uh, wetland conditions. Structure my talk around these three topic areas. And for each section, I'll leave a few minutes for any uh, questions you may have. Okay, so let's, uh, let's begin. I all agree that the ecological value of wetlands is well recognized. Um, we also know that California has lost the largest portion of its west wetland acreage, so the resource requires um, some form of management um, for, for, for the resource. In California, the responsibility for regulating and managing wetlands is divided among a number of state, federal, and local agencies, each of management functions. So, so just to say, there's a lot of uh, considerable, considerable amount of wetland monitoring occurring throughout California via these various agencies. However, the lack of a coordinated and standardized assessment tool has hindered the state's ability to answer key management questions. In addition, large amounts of public funds and human resources have invested in the protection, restoration, and creation of wetlands and other aquatic resources in California over the past several decades. However, evaluating the net effect of these investments relative to ongoing wetland degradation has been difficult because of the issues I mentioned before. Subsequently, we, can't, um, we cannot answer fundamental questions. Are we making a difference? What is the net effect of our actions? Are our wetland programs effective? And is additional investment justified? So the state really needs the ability to accurately track the condition of its wetland resources in order to evaluate the outcome of its investments now and into the future. That's really what was the goal of developing CRAM or the California Rapid Assessment Method. Provide a means to answer those questions I just mentioned to you through the development of a rapid, scientifically defensible, and standardized cost effective assessment tool to be used to assess the status and trends in the condition of wetlands and the performance of related policies, programs, and projects throughout California. So really, in a nutshell, that was that was the whole impetus for, for developing this assessment method. So let's just learn some of the basics of what, what is CRAM. Topics for discussion include um, a very brief overview of the, uh, of the overview of the method and a little bit on the development, some context um, for how CRAM fits into the larger state monitoring program for wetlands. And then I'm going to go into a few slides on the mechanics and how, how you score some of the CRAM metrics and actions. So in the way of development, um, the CRAM has essentially been funded through the U.S. EPA since 2002 um, to build capacity to assess wetlands. And this has really been through a series of wetland development grants, the 104B3 grants. Um, the, the CRAM development team consisted of a, a principal investigating team, a statewide team, and regional teams. The PIs work with sponsoring agencies to form a statewide core team and the regional teams. The state team fostered collaboration and coordination among the regions to produce a rapid assessment method that is consistent for all kinds of wetlands throughout California. The state team consisted of the PIs plus technical experts in government agencies, um, NGOs, and academia. So the regional members assisted in the verification and validation of CRAM, which I'll be talking about a little later, and provided feedback to the state team about the utility of CRAM in the context of regional wetland regulation and management. 
general teams consisted of PIs and local and regional wetland experts with experience in wetland assessment methodology. The members of each of these state and regional teams are listed in the acknowledgement section in the front end of the CRAM user's manual, which will also be discussed a little later in the, uh, the presentation. But really, on the CRAM development um, um, process, um, began essentially with like, developing these conceptual models of wetland form and function, and then reviewing other RAMs that have developed uh, that have been developed throughout the United States. Um, uh, states like Ohio, Washington, and Florida also have rapid assessment methods. Um, CRAM borrowed um, from a lot of these um, these rapid assessment methods. However, CRAM is considered to have gone one of the most collaborative, intensive, and thorough development process for any um, RAM or rapid assessment method in the state. Um, review of other RAMs took place. There was a verification phase, which we, we like to call the lab test. You know, did the wording of the CRAM metrics make sense? Did the basic structure make sense? This is all based on you know, best professional judgment and EPJ of the principal investigators, and then some, some basic field testing. Once that verification phase uh, and revisions made, the validation phase took place. And this is the process where um, scores are compared against um, quantitative data, such as bird po population data, bug population data, plant plant data. Um, CRAM scores are correlated to this quanti quantitative data. And in addition to the validation, there was a testing of repeatability within and among teams, which is a very important part of the, the CRAM development uh, methodology. So that's all development. So uh, just as a brief overview, CRAM is really, I think, best described as structured best professional judgment. It's a standardized uh, walk and talk diagnostic tool to assess wetland condition. Some people like to say wetland health. Um, it's meant to be rapid, less than four hours of field time, although there is an office component in addition to that. CRAM is meant to be um, conducted in, in teams, at least two people, maybe three people, but, but no more than three. And all CRAM is qualitative in nature. It does require some proficiency in um, and expertise in wetland ecology. We like to say it's an expertise comparable to what you need to conduct a, a, a typical wetland jurisdiction. <coughs> Training component is an extremely important part um, to achieve the standardization and consistent application of the CRAM method. And I'll be talking a little bit about training later in the presentation. Showing you here on, on this slide is the two-page CRAM information sheet that's available at the CRAM website. It's, a, it's a, a short document that you can download from the website. And I'll be giving you that website later on. Okay, so this is the basic conceptual model for CRAM. Um, fairly simple. CRAM assesses wetland condition or health based on four overarching attributes, which include the landscape context, the hydrology, physical structure, and the biotic structure. And you're going to be seeing this slide um, over the course of this presentation several times. Um, uh, CRAM meant for all to apply to all wetlands in California. The CRAM wetland typology currently recognizes major wetland types, four of which have subtypes, and I've listed um, on the slide here. For CRAM, the term wetland is defined by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service under the Cowardin classification system. Um, CRAM typology reflects various elements of different classification systems, including Cowardin, the hydrogeomorphic classification used by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and topologies that are used in existing state wetland policies. But over favors HGM or the hydrogeomorphic classification overall with um, the subtypes that you can see listed here reflecting state policy. I want to note here that CRAM does not delineate jurisdiction nor are CRAM assessments constrained by jurisdictional boundaries. So consequently, CRAM assessment areas may include areas considered wetlands, waters of the U.S., waters of the state, uplands, depending on the specific site, type of system being assessed, location in California, and specific agency jurisdictional definition. So I think that's an important point to make um, when, when conducting CRAM. So going back to the conceptual model, which in, within each of those four attributes are a number of metrics that assess more specific aspects of wetland condition. And these metrics are, are what you are actually assessing in the field when you conduct CRAM. This example is two metrics that comprise the landscape connectivity attribute. This is landscape, um, uh, I'm sorry, the landscape context attribute. This is landscape connectivity, which is essentially connectivity of the site with other aquatic resources, and then 
various characteristics of the buffer. So these are two metrics within the landscape context attributes. Well, some CRAM metrics are comprised of submetrics. And in this example, um, shows the three submetrics that comprise the buffer metric, which is one of the metrics of a landscape context attribute. To note that not all metrics have submetrics, and this is just specific um, to the buffer in this case. Uh, here I'm showing you an example of how um, CRAM metrics are scored, and I'm using the buffer width of metric as an example. In this case, there's a description for all metrics to represent mutually exclusive alternative states for the full range of possible conditions. You would find alpha score, A through D, in the field and convert this to a numeric score. So you all the, the various alternative states for the buffer width submetric in this case. Um, here's the example of how a CRAM wetland condition score is calculated. Um, this time we're using the metric that comp com comprise the body structure um, attribute, um, excuse me, yeah, attribute. Um, metric alpha scores are converted to numeric scores like we did before. The numeric scores are then summed and divided by the total number of points possible for that attribute. In the case of the structure attribute in this example, the total points possible is 36. So site, um, received 27 out of 36 possible and received a 75 for the biotic structure attribute. And I know that metrics are equally weighted within these attribute, attribute scores. That was the intention when I'm developing the program. So 75 for biotic structure, and you would calculate an attribute score for the remaining four, um, the remaining three attributes. And average, it's a simple averaging of those four scores to arrive at an overall uh, wetland condition score. So these, um, these attributes, I will also note, are equally weighted within the overall score. So this, you, get, you receive a CRAM score of 52, and in the presentation, the main part of my presentation will be really talking about what, what a 52 means when we were talking about um, what wetland condition. I just wanted to take you through the mechanics of, of how you calculate these scores for CRAM. So in addition to producing that, those scores, the CRAM condition score, CRAM also includes a stressor checklist. For the purposes of CRAM, a stressor is an anthropogenic perturbation within a wetland or its setting that is likely to negatively impact the wetland. So each attribute has its own stressor checklist associated with it. Um, the CRAM stressor checklist helps to explain CRAM scores and identify possible management actions to improve condition. And when CRAM developed, a conscious effort was made to separate anthropogenic stress from condition scores. And way no a priori judgment was made on the source of the condition score or why a particular wetland scored as it did with CRAM. And important to note as well, the stressor checklist does not influence the CRAM condition scores. Uh, just that meant to be an informative um, provide information on why why scores um, the way they were the way they are. So so I just walked you through the basic scoring system for CRAM and the stressor checklist. So it, it, it's a fairly straightforward, um, straightforward process for, for arriving at a CRAM condition score. Um, so at this point, I think it's important to mention that CRAM has um, undergone extensive technical review and iterative refinement for all CRAM wetland types. In addition, the riverine and estuarine wetland classes have been validated against independent and more intensive measures of condition, including benthic macroinvertebrates, herd, and plant um, richness and diversity, and resulted in the refinement of metrics for some for these particular wetland types and provides a higher level of confidence in the ecological meaning of CRAM scores. So that CRAM validation paper is the first one um, I mentioned on the slide, the Stein et al. 2009. Um, the other general um, articles on CRAM, um, on rapid assessment in general in California, the second one. There was a mitigation project review, Ambrose et al., 2005 and 6, which used CRAM to assess mitigation projects. And then CRAM has gone a few peer reviews. Uh, one that was completed in 2008 is through the um, U.S. Army Corps Engineering Research and Development Center, or ERDIC. Also, uh, CRAM is also currently undergoing um, a review from the State Water Resources Control Board, and um, this review is complete, but the results are pending. In addition, there's a technical bullet on using CRAM to assess the projects for regulatory programs, and I'll be talking a lot more about this um, 
later on in the presentation. And all of are available for download at the CRAM website, cramweapons.org, which is slide as well. Okay, so um, before I talk about the state context for CRAM, I, I was um, going uh, to take questions on uh, investing. Sound quality for everybody. Or oh, Eric. It sounds okay. good. Uh, Biddy. Yeah, I'll I'll try to try to speak speak a little more slowly and clearly. Other things? Does anyone in, anything? Uh, I was just uh, I'm just trying to give you a really brief overview of, of kind of a, the process and how a cram score is as a ride that. So that was and we'll talk more about this later in the presentation. Okay. Okay, great. I think it's important at this point to, to really understand how CRAM fits into the larger state uh, wetland monitoring program. And my next set of slides will, will cover this, and I'll try to get through these fairly quickly. So many of you may not know that California is in the process of developing a state wetland program. It really currently doesn't doesn't have one at this time. Uh, so in November of 2007, uh, Senate Bill 1070 was mandated, mandated the establishment of the California Water Quality Monitoring Council. And this is a council shared by uh, representatives of the Natural Resources Agency and Cal California EPA. The goal of the Monitoring Council is to develop specific recommendations to improve the coordination and cost effectiveness of water quality and ecosystem monitoring and assessment enhance the integration of monitoring data across departments and agencies and increase public accessibility to monitoring data and assessment information um, for all of California. Um, Based subcommittees coordinate the details of the Council's uh, various member agency programs, and these programs are focused around question-driven monitoring and information dissemination. Showing you here is a screen capture of the Monitoring Council's My Water Quality website that list questions of interest. Um, the link is provided in yellow at the top for this um, for this website, and I'm going to talk uh, more about this later. In 2008, the California Wetland Monitoring Work Group was endorsed as a subcommittee of the California Water Monitoring Council. That was the council I just was discussing. Um, this, the, the wetland work group is composed of state and federal co-chairs plus an uh, Senate Bill 1070 liaison, and there's um, federal, state, and academic participating uh, agencies and organizations. The goal of the wetland monitoring work group is, is essentially the development, coordination, and implementation of all wetland monitoring across California, so a pretty broad goal here. Still there? there. It's lost sound. Yep, me too. Okay. Whoops, something happened on my web screen. Uh -huh.
everybody. This is yes. Chris again. So we had a little technical difficulty there. So I apologize for that. Okay. Okay. So, um, so California Wetland Monitoring Work Group. So we have a goal of development, coordination, and implementation of wetland monitoring across California. And hopefully the sound quality is a little better now. Okay. So, the WMW, or the Monitoring Work Group, models its approach to wetland monitoring and assessment on the U.S. EPA's Level 123 Framework for Monitoring and Assessment of Wetland Resources. So it's actually three levels. Level 1 are resource inventory and maps. Level 2, rapid assessment of overall wetland condition. And Level 3 is intensive assessment of specific functionality. And I think this is what um, we're most uh, uh, familiar with. This, these are the bird surveys, the intensive plant surveys that, are, that occur at, at various sites. So each level assessment can be used to answer specific questions. For level one, we're interested in you know where the wetlands are um, geographically in the region. Level two is looking at condition assessment. Um, what are the regional condition, the ambient condition of wetlands, or the condition uh, of a project compared to that regional condition. And then intensive assessment answers specific um, questions on functionality. For instance, is the wetland impacted by contaminants? So I take away from this slide is under this framework, CRAM is a level two tool that is used to help answer questions related to wetland condition, either in the ambient or project specific context. And that's kind of the framework that we're approaching CRAM, CRAM with. And this slide shows you the overall structure of the state's nascent state um, wetland program. Um, ongoing coordination of the wetland of wetland monitoring activities occurs through the various subcommittees of the California Wetland Monitoring Work Group, operating under the monitoring monitoring council's overall guidance and approval. So the two work work group that you can see in the middle focuses on all aspects of CRAN development and implementation. So you have a one and a level two and a level three work group, all reporting to the California Wetland Monitoring Work Group. Regional teams refer to the various regions of California, you know, such as South Coast, the Sierra Nevada region, and each subcommittee, level one, two, and three, has a uh, of the California Wetland Monitoring Work Group contains a regional representative on each of those work groups. It's the structure of how this wetland program is, is is developing for California. I think it's important to see where CRAM fits into this, that it is intended as a statewide tool and not just a regional tool. Okay, so one of the priority work areas of the California Wetland Monitoring Work Group is the development of a state wetland and riparian monitoring program. We call this the RAMP. There's a lot of information on this slide, and I'm not going to say much more on this, but I really wanted just to point out that CRAM is one of the products of the California Wetland Monitoring Work Group, and the document contains quite a bit of information about the state wetland monitoring program. This document's available for download on the, the Monitoring Work Group's website, and I'll provide that URL um, at the end of the presentation. You can download this. Okay, so getting in more of the nuts and bolts of how does CRAM work. Um, hopefully that's giving you some context of, of where CRAM fits in the state, pro, state picture. Um, before I start going into the mechanics, I just want to know if there's any questions so far in any of the information I presented. And it sounds a lot better, so um, that's good. So any questions, um, either to be at or, or you can ask them via phone, either way. Okay, great. Okay. So how does CRAM work? So you've been introduced to the CRAM, you know, conceptual approach to assessing wetland condition. You've seen this already. We have four attributes and condition and a stressor checklist. There are steps to conducting a CRAM assessment. I'm not going to go into any of these in any great detail today, but I wanted to make you aware that there is a process for conducting a CRAM assessment, um, uh, you know, a complete CRAM assessment. And see there's eight steps from starting with assembling background information to the point of where you submit uh, assessment results to the, the CRAM database. Um, training program and training materials available to practitioners of the CRAM method, and, and we offer this if people really want to, to learn the, the mechanics of how you apply CRAM in the field. There's a CRAM user's manual um, in 5.2. It's complete for all wet classes. We have a number of field books, complete for river estuarine and vernal pools, and, and the regional three-day practitioner trainings. And we, we approach this for one wetland type 
and then people take the three-day practitioner trainings, and then you're able to take a two-day add-on module for additional wetland type. So you might take three-day riverine, and then you're sitting do learning more about estuarine. You would take that two add-on module. Um, at this time, there's no certification um, in the CRAM method, but a list of trained CRAM practitioners is included on the CRAM website um, for public display. And in fact, we have a two-day estuarine training coming up here at SCORP on October 5th. That's intended um, for people who have already had a three-day training. Okay. So I think most important to understand that the fundamental unit evaluation for a CRAM assessment is termed the assessment area, or AA is what I like. We like to call it the A, the portion of the wetland that is assessed using CRAM. And in this example, I'm showing you is for a, a riverine site. And to the CRAM assessment, each of the metrics is evaluated for a particular A in the field to yield a numeric score, which we've already learned about. And this is based on either narrative or schematic descriptions of condition or on thresholds across continuous values. Okay, um, so there are several considerations for delineating the CRAM assessment area that are important. Uh, first is the purpose of the assessment. Is, are, are you using it to assess a project, or is this part of an ambient monitoring program? If it's a project, um, it might be a large project. You might need multiple AAs to cover the entire site. If it's just an ambient um, program, and this is a point located through a probabilistic draw, it might just require one, one uh, CRAM assessment. Um, and there's also the issue of hydrogeomorphic integrity. Only one wetland class can be assessed at a time. So, for instance, if a seep wetland drains into an adjacent depressional wetland, these two systems must be addressed separately. Um, hydro breaks um, for river wetlands, such as confluences, major river tributaries, or culverts, also can separate cram assessment areas. The idea of having these these hydrogeomorphic breaks is to maximize detection of management effects and to ensure that CRAM has the likelihood of being sensitive to any management changes that occur. And there's also size limits for AAs. Um, Large AAs might have higher or more variable scores, so we have to standardize what the size limits for the AAs that people are assessing. In addition, a proposed assessment area cannot be too large for two people to assess in a half day, so the CRAM guidelines provide limits for, for CRAM assessment areas as well. And those are important considerations. It's essentially a field-based method, but some of the metrics um, rely on background information and best assessed in the office or can be initially assessed in the office um, subject to field verification once you're out at the site. And these metrics include um, submetrics and submetrics of the buffer and landscape context attribute. And then one of the um, hydrology attribute metrics is just the water source, so what are the inputs of fresh water coming into the site? Something you can actually do in the field prior to going out to the site. Here's the example of average buffer width that could be used um, of one metric that can be assessed in the office using aerial imagery, again, subject to field verification. In this case, the average buffer width came out to 68 uh, meters, and you can see the C. Um, for um, for that particular uh, um, um, submetric, major CRAM metrics are assessed in the field using a com uh, narrative accounts, worksheets, diagrams, or a combination of, of all of those above. Um, and these include the buffer condition submetric, hydrology metrics, and all the metrics comprising the physical and biotic structure attributes. So all of these are are assessed in the field. Here's just one example of a narrative account that is used to score a submetric in the field. In this case, this is the buffer condition submetric. It considers the amount of native plants, how intact the soils are, what is the intensity of human visitation. So the combination of these three submetrics with the other buffer submetrics is used to score the buffer metric. So this is just an example of a narrative account from the, for CRAM. An example of a worksheet that is used to score the structural patch um, patch richness, and this is one of the metrics comprising the physical structure attribute. Structural patch richness is uh, defined as the number of different obvious patch types um, or features that may provide habitat for aquatic or riparian species. For each wetland class, there is a different list relevant to the type of structural patch types that would be expected in the wetland class. And you check off boxes of structural patches that are present within the AAA. Let me turn on this little pointer here. So the various um, um, 
types of patches that you could, um, could find. This is for riverine uh, wetlands. And you could see where you have a one, you would expect that patch to occur. Where you have a zero, you would expect that, you, you would ignore it. You don't expect that patch to be um, at that site. So this is a site, an example for riverine wetlands. Other wetland classes may have different, uh, different number and different types of patches for that particular wetland class. Okay. Here. Example of a diagram that's used to assess um, hormonal interspersion and zonation. This is one of the metrics comprising the biotic structure attribute. Um, hormonal biotic structure refers to the variety and interspersion of plant zones. Um, interspersion is essentially a measure of the amount of edge between those zones. And this is an example of the schematic used to assess riverine wetlands. Um, diagrams are used for the other wetland classes. And here's a site that would probably score B in CRAM. So just run on a schematic diagram. Okay, lastly is an example of the CRAM scoring sheet that's actually used in the field. And this may be a better way to illustrate the relationship of the various submetrics, metrics, attributes um, um, for CRAM. Um, metrics, in this case, these are the three plant community submetrics are components of the plant community metric and three biotics, uh, three metrics, these metrics here comprise the biotic structure attribute. And then formula, formulas are provided um, if you need to calculate the scores in the field. So then the average of the four attributes here provide the overall CRAM index score. We've already talked about this, but this might be a better way for some people to visualize um, the, the CRAM scoring. Okay, so in addition to calculating um, um, score metrics, attributes, and the overall condition, CRAM also includes a stressor checklist. We've seen this already. And I just wanted to provide you an example. This is the um, stressor checklist for the hydrology attribute, and each of the attributes have a corresponding stressor checklist. Okay. So that's as far as I'm going to go into the, the mechanics of CRAM. As I mentioned, we have a, a, a full training program that's really devoted to the learning the ins and outs of the method. And so that's what those three-day practitioner trainings are intended for. So I, I really get into the, the meat of this, and this is CRAM applications and score interpretation, which I, and the main part of the presentation. Are there any questions so far on anything I've discussed? I have anybody in any chat or, uh, or any questions so far? So. Okay. Cram application and implementation. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how you interpret Cram scores, some of the applications that uh, are currently being used for Cram. This is really uh, specific to project assessment, but we'll also be talking a little bit about ambient assessments. And I think it's important to talk about Cram data management and how this Cram data is going to be archived. And you know, and eventually used, hopefully. So you've seen how CRAMS uh, submetrics, metrics, and attribute scores aggregate into an overall um, uh, condition or, or, or index score. You've seen this already. We just this, and you learned a little bit about how CRAM metrics are scored in the office and in the field to arrive um, at that overall uh, index score as well. So really, I think the big question, probably on most people's minds is uh, what does a CRAM score mean, and how can I interpret CRAM results? So CRAM scores represent, and we've already overall condition. Some people like to term this functional capacity or aquatic health. Uh, CRAM score is numerical. We already mean it's an actual score. It's repeatable. You can go out to the same site and arrive at a, a, another score. But there's no units um, associated with the score. Uh, it's important to point out that a CRAM score does not represent any particular function or set of functions. Um, remember, CRAM is a level two assessment tool. That's why we have the level three. That's why we have the and the plant data. That's um, that's important to go along with those CRAM assessments. I, I think a way of looking at a CRAM score is it it's analogous to um, something like an APGAR score, which is which measures newborn newborn infant health. Um, a Dow Jones Industrial Average, a GNP, or a GPA is a good way to look at a CRAM score. It's the PA for, for a wetland. Um, it's important to point out here that multiple combinations of attribute scores can yield the same overall 
um, CRAM score. So in this case, a CRAM score of 56 was arrived at through a combination of uh, various attribute scores. Similarly, um, each attribute score or can be explained by its particular set of contributing metrics scores. So uh, I think the takeaway from this that really most of the information in a CRAM assessment is contained in the attribute and the metric scores because as you can see, an overall index score can mean different things depending on how those attributes and those various metrics scored. And we'll be talking a little more about how you report CRAM scores as well. Okay. CRAM is intended to be a diagnostic tool to provide an assessment of overall wetland condition at a particular point in time. So each attribute score represents a suite of expected functions, but it's not measuring those functions. As I mentioned, that's why you would use a level three uh, 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 proto to do that. So I'll just give some examples. Landscape and buffer attribute represents ecological connectivity at the landscape scale, ability of the buffer to mediate external stresses, et cetera. The hy hydrology attribute represents um, various functions as well. So it's in to point out that condition is the status at a particular specific point in time. That's what CRAM is measuring, whereas function is a process occurring over time. And again, that's why you would be um, you know, including that level three data to really get at those questions um, related to function. In many cases, CRAM will, will need to be used in conjunction with not only level three, but the one methods to support assessment of wetland condition for decision making purposes. Level methods also allow you to get at the functional aspects of the wetland being assessed, and I, I think that's a point that um, we really need to make clear when we're, when we're applying CRIM. Okay. So, application of CRAM scores. Individual CRAM metric scores, attribute scores, and the overall AA scores are based on an internal reference standard that represents the best achievable, achievable conditions statewide for the type of wetland being assessed. Therefore, any two scores for the same type of wetland can be compared to each other because they are based on the same same statewide standard. For example, an assessment area having a, a score 50 can be interpreted as having lower ecological condition than an uh, assessment area of the same wetland type with a score of 80. A similar interpretation can be made for attribute scores, and these scores range from 25 to 100, 25 being the lowest. So what values are you using? In CRAM is the ability to compare scores from projects and ambient surveys from different projects or from the same project over time. This ability to make comparisons based on a common assessment tool like CRAM provides the context for interpretation of scores for specific projects. However, the particular applications of CRAM for specific projects will ultimately be at the discretion of each agency as part of its permitting or grant programs. So CRAM has been and is currently being used in a number of programs. Um, it's been used for a variety of statewide assessments. Um, it was used to assess per, um, the, the condition of perennial tidal estuaries in California. I have a few slides coming up on that. It's currently being used through the Swamp Perennial Stream Assessment, or the PSA. Um, this is an assessment of um, people weightable streams in California. It's one of the um, you know, one of the uh, tools being used to assess condition. It's also being used at the regional level. It's being used through um, a stormwater monitoring coalition monitoring program, which is really essentially the Southern California version of the PSA, but it's a regionally based only in the South Coast here. It's being used at the watershed scale through the San Gabriel River monitoring program. CRAM is, CRAM is a, a tool being used there. And as well, uh, CRAM has been used for program evaluation for compensatory mitigation, mainly through the 404 program at this point, eventually through the 401 program, and for restor restoration effectiveness. A lot of this has been, um, work has been conducted through the work of the Southern California Wetland Recovery Project. So it is being used, and a lot of data is being generated. Okay. So most information I will be discussing on CRAM implementation issues comes from um, the CRAM Technical Bulletin, and this is entitled Using CRAM to Assess Wetland Projects as an Element of Regulatory and Management Programs. This document was developed by the California Wetland Monitoring Work Group and endorsed by the California, Wetland, um, California Water Quality Monitoring Council in October um, 2009. This document represents the common technical foundation that agency, agencies can use to develop specific guidance and policies for the use of CRAM. Um, 
um, of this document is available for download at the California Wetland Monitoring Workgroup website and at the official CRAM website, and I've listed those there. Yeah, I was just looking at the questions here. Sorry, guys. Um, I mean, I'm required like enough. So our question is, how can CRAM possibly assess bentham macroinvertebrate out actual collection of data? Um, you need uh, the answer to that question is uh, through that verification phase. You need to have that data first in order to verify CRAM. So. Um, can make the assumption, you know, what, once you, you've collected the data and you've seen a correlation with a CRAM score and data, you can assume in that case later on you go to a, to a wetland site and it has a, a specific, you know, high CRAM score. And if you've seen positive correlations that, you know, densities um, or bug communities correlate with CRAM score, can make that assumption that a higher scoring wetland will have a, a more intact um, benthic macrovertebrate community. So hopefully that answers that. Um, did that, I, I, it looks like Lawrence, I, did that answer your question? Okay. Okay, so, so the technical bulletin is really important. I encourage you all to uh, to, to know that and really look through that. Okay. So the purpose of the CRAM technical bulletin is to address technical issues related to the use of CRAM for project assessment in particular, and I've listed many of the components that this document discusses. So the intent is to support consistent and appropriate application of CRAM for regulatory, mitigation, and restoration projects across a variety of state and federal programs. This document does not constitute any official agent-specific guidance or policy, but addresses a set of overarching technical issues and considerations as they relate to CRAM. And we're going to be talking a little bit about these um, um, through the rest of the talk. Um, so the appropriate uses of CRAM include application to state or regional ambient monitoring. Um, typically, ambient monitoring employs some type of probabilistic or random sampling design to assess wind conditions. It can also be used to monitor, you know, large ecological reserves, medication banks, or refuges. A few examples of, of ambient monitoring uh, work was used in the following slides. I've mentioned that in 2007, CRAM was used to assess the condition of estuarine wetlands in California. This is the four coastal regions of the state where we targeted friendly tidal saline estuaries, and 150 sites were publicly selected. And annual sampling design used an unequal probability-based allocation of sites based on the percent of vegetated intertidal marsh acreages, acreage. And as I mentioned, was used to assess condition. And uh, most recent um, national wetland inventory maps of estuarine wetlands were, were used for this survey at the time. This was done in 2007. So the results of this survey, this is a cumulative frequency distribution graph, or CFD. Some of you may be familiar with these. Um, this um, showing CRAM index scores. Um, scores on the x-axis by region as a function of the percent of area of perennially tidal estuarine marsh. And that's, um, so our x scores are here, and our percent area of, of, um, of marsh are on the y-axis. So this data that S wetland condition generally decreases from north to south. North Coast wetlands in blue had the highest mean ambient scores, followed by the San Francisco Bay region in red, the San Central Coast in green. The mean ambient scores for the south coast, uh, the black line, were the lowest of the four regions. The attribute scores generally follow the same trends as the index scores. So I just wanted to provide this data as an example of how CRAM was used um, in an ambient survey of wetland condition, in this case for, for estuarine wetlands. So here's an example of how CRAM was used in, a, in another ambient assessment, but this time at the watershed scale. This is an example, example from the San Gabriel River watershed here in, the, in Southern California. And in this case, this program used a combination of random and targeted site monitoring 
uh, it was a plastic sampling of 30 sites, you know, these are our ambient sites, and then the targeted sampling at key confluence points along the watershed. Um, this focused on multiple metrics. Um, it used CRAM as a level two tool, but it also incorporated level three data, which would include things like water chemistry, assessment, um, you know, benthic macroinvertebrates, and toxicity. So the case where CRAM was collected in addition to level um, to the um, the level three data. Okay, I'm going to speed here. Uh, the point I'd like to make is that knowing something about the ambient condition provides valuable context for site-specific monitoring. This is actual data from the San Gabriel River program I showed you, and it illustrates the range of conditions throughout the San Gabriel watershed. That's that ambient line you see, that black line. This is, again, a CDF graph showing the CRAM scores on the x-axis and the percent CRAM AAs on the y-axis. So the take here is this ambient curve provides context for the CRAM scores for a place like Bear Creek, which received a high cramp score, and a lower scoring site for San Jose Creek. So you really see the range of conditions that are achievable in particular watershed. Okay. So for uses of cramp for project assessment, a cramp may be applied to support a variety of regulatory applications as listed above. Typically, wetland impact analysis and compensatory mitigation or restoration planning and monitoring will require more information than cram will provide. In some cases, appropriate level three protocols already exist. In other cases, additional level two or three assessment tools may be needed to be developed to conduct the assessment. And I'm going to, um, you know, hit point again that CRAM is intended to be used in conjunction with level one and level three tool tools and not replace them. CRAM should not be used as sole basis for making regulatory or project decisions. Rather, it should be used in conjunction with other information and data to inform regulatory and project decisions. This list you know, provides some examples of inappropriate uses of CRAM. However, it's not exhaustive. Um, the appropriate agency should be consulted prior to any application of CRAM. But these are just some of the things we consider inappropriate uses of, of the method. And this is CRAM technical bulletin. Following two slides, I just wanted to provide some general guidance for assessment of projects. Here's one scenario for when a project wetland is smaller than the CRAM assessment area. The intended AA boundary includes areas beyond the project area. So this is a very small project. So wetland project area is smaller than the suggested minimum size. You need to conduct two CRAM assessments, one for the project area and one on the assessment area defined according to the rules of the CRAM manual. Both sets of scores should be reported for consideration in agency decision making. And the second scenario is probably a more common scenario, in which case the project is much larger than the CRAM assessment area, and multiple CRAM assessments will be need, need to be completed to completely characterize the project. In this example, the entire project area has been divided into a series of CRAM assessment areas, each of which is, is then assessed with CRAM. This is an example from San Alito Lagoon in San Diego County. As you can see, many CRAM assessments may potentially be needed to characterize a very large wetland area. According to the guidelines in CRAM. Okay. So, if human resources preclude the assessment of all potential CRAM assessment areas, and most likely they will in, in, in reality, a statistically representative subset of AAs may be assessed using the procedures outlined in the CRAM user's manual and the technical bulletin. So, we do provide guidance of how you could assess a large wetland area. This guidance is mainly intended for assessment of large contiguous wetland areas, typically something like an estuary or a depressional wetland. But with some modification, you can apply it to riverine wetlands as well. Okay. Um, there are some important caveats when using CRAM to assess projects. The first is that under no circumstances should CRAM metrics or attributes be modified. Doing so validate the CRAM assessment. Um, and modification of the method will reduce or eliminate the scientific reliability and defensibility associated with the development in the review process of CRAM. So we, we don't um, recommend modifying any of the metrics at this point, and avoid multiplying CRAM scores by linear area is another caveat. So by multiplying CRAM scores by area or linear distance, it may not represent the true relationship between conditions at different scales and at different area or linear extent. Multiplying CRAM scores by any dimension might distort the scaling of metrics, weight values of other metrics in unintended ways, or lead to erroneous results. Use of CRAM scores in deciding mitigation requirements or project performance criteria should really recognize this limit of CRAM at the time. But we realize that combining assessments with spatial dimensions of areas is desirable, uh, and people are going to use this. 
so currently compiling data from early CRAM applications that will be used to determine if multiple NCRAM scores is valid. In future versions of the technical guidelines, we'll revisit this issue over time. And look at changes in the wetland area. These are better assessed at the level one, you know, using maps if you really want to see if a change in wetland area has occurred. Okay, and I'm um, quickly go through summarizing multiple CRAM scores, average metric scores. Um, we, we suggest that you just use average of metric scores to calculate CRAM attribute and overall scores. Averaging scores is probably the best way to go at this point. And then the ability to CRAM to compare scores to the regional AMBI assessment data, which is available on the CRAM website, is another way to, comp to uh, compare project scores to the, to the statewide AMBI assessment of that particular wetland type. Get close to them here. These just I'm just quickly go through these applications where CRAM was used. In this case, with a large development project to look at riverine wetlands, as you could see, new CRAM assessment areas um, needed to be delineated using the guidelines. In this case, and it was just uh, the mitigation analysis table that came out of this project and provided as just an example of an application of CRAM. Um, they list post-project CRAM condition scores as well as pre-project scores, and they list the change CRAM scores scores between pre and post project. This is and then below there is a graphic to illustrate one way you can visualize this type of data. Just um, providing an example, Alpha Creek restoration monitoring a similar scenario where they report the current CRAM score and minimum CRAM score attainable. Just another example. And then this graphic is just provided as a way to um, look at CRAM data uh, in the perspective of reference sites. CRAM score mitigation sites are compared to CRAM scores from reference sites using what they term a spider web diagram. This is actual data from a, from a report. And, excuse me, monitoring uh, CRAM scores over time. I think this is an important slide. Project evaluation using CRAM can provide a means to track the relative improvement in wetland condition of a specific portion of wetland acreage. This is a nice example of how CRAM can be used to monitor restoration activities over time. Restoration project scores are overlaid on the watershed cumulative distribution frequency graph of, of, of CRAM scores, and that's this green one right here. Movement CRAM score along the population distribution defines here at time one a low initial score, and then we have a drop in score due to the landform change from the restoration perhaps, and then a quick response on time period three of a vegetation recruitment, and, and at three and four, and then five here, we have additional weed management and planting might drop the condition score at this point in time, at time five. Uh, I'm sorry, evasion, um, excuse me, evasion of non-native weeds may drop the condition score at time five, and then additional weed management may raise the condition score due to weed management and planting at time six and seven. And final full condition is achieved at point eight. So these are um, eight different points in time. So all condition change from from the 30th percentile to 70th percentile wetlands within within this particular watershed. So it's a good issue how CRAM could be used to monitor restoration over time. Um, the CRAM technical guidelines also contain important information on CRAM QA and QC, quality insurance. There's things like minimum reporting requirements. Um, the audit process is a, re is a really important part of QA. It will consist of trained CRAM instructors and development team members, and the, the plan is to have these audit teams review to 15% of all submitted CRAM assessments annually for each region. And there's also guidance on precision targets for CRAM assessments, how to um, ensure accuracy of assessments, deal with things like seasonal variability of CRAM scores, and multiple versions of the CRAM assessment that people might be using. This is all in the technical um, guidelines. Um, look, I'm really running out of time, and um, CRAM data management, I just have a few um, slide um, of how CRAM data uh, is managed, and I'll quickly go through these. Uh, CRAM data currently resides in two locations. Um, the first one is the CRAM wetland, um, cramwetlands.org site. Um, that is uh, the official CRAM website. This website is the source of all CRAM-related information. This is a screenshot from the website. You register, you register before downloading software and uploading data, and looking and viewing that data. Registering will also get you on the mailing list for updates and news on CRAM. This is at the top, uh, cramwetlands.org. And then you've already seen the Monitoring Council's Mike Water, Water Quality website, and this site provides a global point of entry for a series of theme-based web pages for all state water quality um, and assessment products throughout the state. 
and the aquatic ecosystem health is how you access something called the California Wetland Portal, also contained here. And here's uh, the aquatic ecosystem's health. Um, at this point, the wetlands tab is the only tab that's uh, active. This takes you to the California Wetlands Portal, and I provided you the uh, URL to that um, to that site, the main page of the portal that you're looking at. The wetland portal provides general information on the extent and condition of wetlands in the state, answers general questions about uh, wetlands in California. Um, a couple more minutes, and these are the type of questions on which information is provided. And again, I encourage you to go to that website to, to, to look this over. In addition, the portal has a tracking function for wetland projects in the state. This is the project tracking page for the South Coast. And by clicking the list of wetland projects takes you to the South Coast project list, where you can access project maps, tabular data, and project files. If you click on the wetland map for Arroyo Borough Estuary, um, you are taken to an interactive display of the project location. You can toggle between the various spatial layers. And the associated CRAM data you can see here is can, can be accessed from this point as well. So this is the uh, California Wetlands Portal. And you have some of the tabular data that's included for different various projects. And files and links, and you are able to access files associated with any project, including CRAM reports, if there are any. And these are available for download in PDF format format, excuse me. So there's a lot of next steps for the poll that you read those very quickly. It's really about building functionality for the current database, merging that eCRAM and project tracking into one base, really improving the online functionality of mapping, um, improving the entry eventually through a 401 online application is the next big step, and adding historical and level three data. So quite a bit to, uh, to on the, the portal. Last slide, um, next sex for CRAM. Um, next steps is um, we're developing a reference network for for CRAM and, and for the state, and this is um, going to be um, initially populated with sites um, next year. There's a continue, continuing work on module development and refinement for depressional wetland, um, a validation study, uh, module for arid ephemeral streams we're working on, and then there's a wet, mod wet, o wet meadow module um, being developed through teams in the Sierra Nevada region. And importantly, I think uh, to you as we are starting um, these two-day agency-specific trainings planned for 2011, and these will be run through the State Water Board Training Academy, and these are intended for all agency staff, not just State Water Board, free of charge, uh, and it's really good to a lot of the information on CRAM application and score interpretation. And with that, I'd like to thank you. I provided my contact information, um, the websites, uh, the URLs for all, all those websites that I have mentioned throughout the talk, and I just want to uh, acknowledge SQRP as well as all of our regional partners. And with that, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. So, um, so that concludes. If, if you have questions, or maybe it's easier to over the phone, or well, you're welcome to chat. What, whatever works. Well, thank you for the presentation, Chris. Um, very interesting and uh, nice summary. Yeah, it, it's a, I, I think we packed a lot into this, so you know, I apologize it went a, went a little long, but I think it's it's important to see, you know, CRAM is a tool, but it, it really has a greater context and a real use at the statewide level, so I, I was really trying to provide that statewide perspective and how it kind of all fits in. The one thing I add is, um, um, Buffers. It seems like even the the lowest category uh, distance with buffers. Uh, that's where we end up when we require buffers around wetlands. Mm -hmm. You know, they're on the order of 100, 200 feet somewhere in there, mm -hmm. and that these all sort of rank into your lowest low rank. So I, I guess that's just some reality. If you're well, doing development, yeah. you're probably don't have a very high functioning or that that attribute. It's well, going to get a low score. It, well, buffer width too. You got to remember, it's a submetric within the buffer, um, w the buffer metric. So we have buffer condition, we have buffer width, and then the percent AA with buffer. So really, a uh, conglomeration of different functions of the buffer. So even if the thing might have a very small buffer in some cases, the condition of that buffer can be very good. 
good. No. So it, it maybe it's little one, it gets a you know a C or a D, but it's that five meter buffer is excellent, and that happens a lot. So you're you're, you're trying to account for that. You know that's why you have those those sub metrics within that buffer metric. Great. Well, thanks very much, this is Jack Gregg from the Coastal Commission, and.